Hi, and I want to thank you all for joining us here tonight. Welcome to the webinar. Um, Nancy and the AESLD have put together a great team of medical experts to um, address our common and our difficult questions about the COVID-19 virus. I'm Karen Hoyt, and I'm a liver disease, um, hepatitis survivor, um, also a cancer liver cancer survivor and a transplant recipient. And I was fortunate enough to be able to volunteer to work on the COVID-19 papers with a team at the AASLD. And what I've learned over the last year is that the governing board of the AASLD and all of its members are deeply concerned with the information that we receive. They have a great desire to help us and to inform us. And I'm so happy to be able to welcome you tonight to this webinar. We are a population of people who have increased risks and um, we're a little nervous about it. And I'm just grateful that this intelligent group of people are ready for your questions. I wanna, first of all, say there are no dumb questions. And as patients, that's the first thing we should know. And the second thing we should know is it is intelligent to ask for help. And we're surrounded by medical experts tonight who are ready and willing and eager to answer all of your questions. So I wanna thank you again and welcome you tonight, patient to patient, we're in this together with liver disease. Thank you for coming. Erin, thanks for opening up the webinar. I too am so excited to be a part of this um, exciting project. And on behalf of AASLD, thank you so much for, um, we, we wanna thank you AASLD for bringing us this webinar to bring to patients. My name is Elizabeth Gocher. I'm a physician assistant. I work at Duke University Liver uh, Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. And by the way, we have a spectrum of representation in our panelists. We're all across the country. So it's exciting that we're all together here in one Zoom session in the many different time zones that we represent. Present. So I want to go over a little bit about the housekeeping for our webinar. Next slide, please. And this is what we're going to. This is what we're going to be seeing tonight. We'll start off now in the introduction phase. Um, we'll move on with what people with liver disease should know about COVID nineteen types of COVID nineteen vaccines. Which one is right for me? Variants. What does this mean for me? And the CDC guidelines. Um, with pre and post vaccination information. Then we'll move on to what we hope is the majority of our, of our session tonight uh, with a lot of answering the questions that you've given us and also accepting questions in the Q&A section. Next slide. So as you know, hopefully you've seen, if you can find this Q webinar Q&A box, be sure and start entering your questions whenever you're ready to do so. And we'll make sure that we'll try and address all of them as, as best we possibly can. We have a lot that patient, people put in beforehand. So we have a lot of um, things ready to go already. Thank you everybody who submitted those. It gives us a little time to be prepared. Um, so with that, I think let's move on to um, getting uh, in familiar with our presenters. Our first presenter will be Sue Wong. She is a physician who is in New Jersey at the St. Barnabas Medical Center and president of the World Hepatitis Alliance, as well as medical director of viral hepatitis programs in the Center for Asian Health. She's also living with hepatitis B. Next slide. Our, no, audition, our next presenter will be Corey Burke. Corey Burke is a DNP or a doctorate of nurse practitioner who works out at the Loma Linda University Health Transplant Institute and is a clinical director at the Las Vegas campus. And Corey's uh, a very uh, big proponent and a big patient advocate, as is Sue. So we were excited that both of them agreed to be our presenters tonight. Additionally, joining us will, as a panelist will be Nancy Rowe, who is in Chicago at Rush University Medical Center and is the Richard B. Capps Chair of Hepatology, the Section Chief of Hepatology, and the Assist Associate Director of Solid Organ Transplantation. Other panelists will be Oren Fix. Dr. Oren Fix is about to um, begin his, uh, his, his position at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So he'll be down the road from me. Um, and Oren is uh, gonna be my favorite color, Tar Heel Blue, even though I do work at the Duke University. Um, and he is also the co-chair of AA Clinical Oversight and Education Committee, as I, and, as, and I also participate on that committee as well. So with that, that brings us to our first presenter. Dr. Wong will be telling us what people with liver disease should know about COVID-19. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm trying to start my video, but it looks like I'm not able to, um, but I can go ahead and just start, here we go. Now I've been asked to start it. All right, great. Um, thanks for the introduction and I'm excited to be here. Um, I have five minutes to cover everything people with liver disease should know um, about COVID and then five minutes to talk about vaccines. So hang on to your seats and I do think the Q&A time will be a great time to uh, flesh out questions that you might have. 
So next slide. Um, I just had the following disclosures. I have research funding from Gilead Sciences. Next. So I just wanna quickly call out the amazing uh, COVID-19 and liver uh, resource page on the ASLD website. There's a section just for patients and you can see here there are many available topics. So please take a look at those um, and give us any feedback on them. I think they're uh, perfectly designed um, to simplify a lot of the messages and make them uh, very understandable. And for clinicians, there are a lot of webinars and expert panel consensus, consensus statements where they've done a good job consolidating a lot of uh, evolving information. And I've drawn from many of these for this talk. Next slide. So um, I just wanna start off with some basics on COVID-19 and the liver. The COVID-19 virus binds to ACE2 receptors. These receptors are present in the lung, as we know, but also throughout the body, including the liver, particularly on bile duct cells. And thus, the liver can be a direct target for viral injury. However, other possible causes of liver injury occur during infection, including severe inflammatory response, drug-induced liver injury, um, as, uh, as visualized here. These injuries are often reflected in the rise of liver enzymes you might see like AST and ALT. In patients, this occurs in about 14 to 83% of people hospitalized with COVID. So in mild COVID, it may be elevated just one to two times normal and it generally self-resolves and is transient. However, liver injury is more common in severe COVID-19 infections and can lead to higher uh, liver enzyme levels. Next. Um, so it does matter what kind of liver condition you have in terms of how COVID-19 might affect you. As we all know, not all liver disease is the same. The conditions which have been associated with higher mortality include cirrhosis, end-stage liver disease, alcohol-associated liver disease, hepatocellular cancer. And as for liver transplants, it's not quite clear. After adjusting for other risk factors, it seems like mortality may not be significantly increased in these patients. Um, and in terms of what conditions are not associated with higher mortality for COVID-19, um, that would be hepatitis B or C infections for those who are non-serotic and autoimmune hepatitis. And in the studies they looked at, 83% of these patients were on immunosuppressives um, and still it wasn't associated with higher mortality. So that's good news. Next. And how about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD, which we know is um, a growing problem um, in the world. So many of the associated conditions, including obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension, those alone are associated with COVID-19 severity and poor outcomes. And so what I tell a lot of my patients, it is even more important for you to continue care and treatment for these conditions during this time. So don't miss your regular visits with your primary care provider or whoever is caring for you for those conditions and utilize telehealth if you are, not, if you are concerned about going in in person. Um, as a PCP myself, I tell my patients that keeping good control of their blood pressure and glucose are really important during this time. You can also request a 90-day supply of your medications and utilize home delivery services from pharmacies to limit going into the pharmacy as often. Keep in mind, independently of these comorbidities, fatty liver disease has been associated with progressive infection and worse outcomes. Next. So how does COVID-19 impact your liver care? So it's really important to protect your health at baseline just by following symptom screening, masking, and social distancing protocols. You should, as I mentioned, continue regular visits to your providers and utilize telehealth if you're concerned or if you are at more risk of severe COVID infection. I assure patients that healthcare facilities take many precautions to keep you safe, and the staff are very cognizant of infection control practices. Now, if you do have symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19, you should get tested. And if you are at higher risk for severe COVID-19 infection, you should definitely have a lower threshold to see your doctor and get tested. Next. So now what about treatment, especially, uh, particularly for hep B or C, autoimmune hepatitis or primary biliary cholangitis during this pandemic? Well, if you're already on treatment, stay on it. It is important to have your conditions controlled. And how about starting new treatment for your liver condition? Well, if you do not have COVID-19, you can start treatment if your doctor recommends it. If you are actively infected with COVID-19, for hep B, you can start hep B treatment, especially if there is a hepatitis flare that's being treated or if it's needed to prevent reactivation, such as in chemotherapy or with a transplant. Now for hep C or PBC treatment, it can be deferred. It is not routinely warranted to treat those conditions while you have active COVID. Next. 
you know, how about COVID-19 and immunosuppressive therapy? So if you are on immunosuppressives, it doesn't necessarily mean you are at more risk for COVID-19, but if you get infected, you may have higher viral titers and you might be considered more infectious. So it is even more important for you to get vaccinated. For autoimmune hepatitis, if you do not have COVID, there is no need to adjust medications. If you are currently um, having acute COVID, the dose may be lowered, particularly uh, zithroprine and mycophenolate, uh, based on the severity of the actual COVID infection. For post-transplant uh, patients with COVID-19, um, we would consider lowering immunosuppression based on the severity of COVID-19 and um, would follow NIH guidelines. Now, how about starting immunosuppressive medications? Do not leave autoimmune conditions uncontrolled during this time. That's an important message to have. You may start immunosuppressive if there are good indications whether or not you have COVID. If you have active COVID infection, your team will be weighing out the risks and the benefits. Next. Having mild to moderate confirmed COVID, um, Oh, sorry. Uh, so what is the outpatient management of COVID-19? So we want to make sure patients know this because you can be an advocate for yourself um, if you are diagnosed with COVID-19. And while in what, when, if you are inpatient, um, a lot of the uh, treatment will be dictated by your inpatient team, but as an outpatient, it is important for patients to know. So the mainstay of active COVID-19 right now is supportive care. So which means rest, over-the-counter treatment, such as um, treating your fever or respiratory symptoms, and of course, isolation to prevent transmission and monitoring closely for worsening symptoms. Again, there is no data supporting hydrochloroquine or azithromycin use. However, there are um, monoclonal antibodies now, which have been shown to be very effective with a 70% reduction in hospitalization and death. There are two kinds made by Regeneron and Eli Lilly. And the eligibility criteria are that you have confirmed COVID, that's mild to moderate uh, severity, not requiring oxygen, and you need to be considered at high risk of progression to severe COVID. And below is the list of criteria, uh, which include a number of factors, including age and comorbidities. Now the monoclonal antibodies are given as an infusion, mostly in emergency departments, and you can talk to your PCP about a referral or be evaluated directly in the ED. And I have to say, I have uh, seen amazing results in my patients who have had to receive it. All right, so next. So on to vaccines and which one is right for me. Next. So almost 3 million people have died of COVID globally. And with the vaccines, we now have an end in sight. And what are the ways to, to slow or contain the, the COVID-19 transmission? So we are all now very familiar with social distancing, masking, quarantine, contact tracing to prevent spread. Um, getting COVID infection can also lead to natural immunity, but this is risky. As we know, even healthy people have died from COVID and our overall death burden would be even higher if we went that route. So, and the safest, quickest way to get immunity to a large population is through vaccinations. So herd immunity occurs when we have enough immunity in the community to effectively stop the spread of the virus. And this is illustrated here. It's estimated that we need up to 60 to 85% of the population immune to reach herd immunity. And to get this, we, we need to vaccinate quickly and thoroughly. And because we need to get as many people immune as possible, the best vaccine for you is the one you can get the soonest. Next. So nationally, how are we doing in the US? The president has ordered all states to make COVID-19 vaccines eligible to every adult starting April 19th, which is this week. And it's been great to see so many people finally able to get the vaccine. So this is our current status as of yesterday. 51% um, of all adults have received one shot and a third of all adults are fully vaccinated by now. And for the high risk elderly group, we are at 81% for one dose and 66% fully vaccinated. And you see the bar graph here, it shows that more than 43 million people have received Pfizer vaccine, 36 million have received Moderna and 7.9 have received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Next. So what types of vaccines are available? There are many kinds being developed around the world, but I'm going to focus on what we have in the US. We have mRNA vaccines, which are the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. And then we have the viral vector vaccine, which uses an inactive adenovirus, that is the J&J &J vaccine. None of these have live virus and are just different mechanisms to get the spike protein information about COVID virus into our bodies. They both essentially teach our immune system how to create antibodies to the virus. So if, that we, so if we are exposed, we can mount a response to fight off the infection. Next. 
So our current vaccines have been issued emergency use authorization by FDA because of the urgent need. Um, so what does this mean for safety? Well, all the steps for clinical trials have been followed as with any new therapeutic and each vaccine has to go through these distinct phases as you see here with increasing numbers of people participating in the trials. Operation Warp Speed brought together the partners, the R&D and the production all together very quickly to work together and, to al and also injected funding. As an example, telehealth is another opportunity which COVID really, where COVID really moved mountains. We had been talking about it for years and we had the technology, but, but the pandemic made telehealth the reality in weeks. So one of the key uh, enablers uh, with the vaccine production, with, with the vaccine was that the production of the vaccine was able to start before authorization, as you see here on this right side, this pathway for um, FDA EUA versus the traditional approval route. Um, and so this is usually a financial risk that companies wouldn't take um, to start production before approval. And uh, this is something that Operation Warp Speed allowed um, to happen. So this made it that as soon as approval was or author authorization was given, it was ready to distribute. You saw all those, those planes flying out of the FedEx facilities with the vaccines. Um, but even with that EUA, FDA required immediate follow-up of two months, and there has been uh, post-authorization monitoring required by FDA and CDC, and the companies will be submitting additional data for the traditional approval of these vaccines. Next. So this is just a snapshot of the data submitted to FDA for the three vaccines, and if you look at the numbers, um, these are quite a number of participants who actually got the vaccine in the trials, and when I compare this to other vaccines that have gone through the traditional approval, it actually exceeds many of those um, submissions. And you can see each one of them had a, over 30,000 people um, get, get the vaccine uh, in the trials. And what was helpful for me as somebody living with liver disease is that these trials did include people with liver disease. Um, they had a mix of people with hep B or hep C who were eligible and other stable chronic liver disease. It's not a lot if you look at the whole scope of things. And so it's really important that we continue to study um, liver populations uh, uh, in the, in the post-marketing phase. Um, and then you, uh, the age, uh, Pfizer is the only one that's approved for 16 and older, the others are 18 and older, and Pfizer has um, submitted to FDA uh, to expand their age starting 12, and we hope that approval happens soon. Next. So um, in terms of the outcome, um, what was all three of the vaccines were 100% effective against death, which is important, and 89 or 89% 89 or higher against hospitalizations. For symptomatic infections, it was all, they were also all very effective, ranging from 66 to 94%. Um, and in terms of the contraindications, um, they are for people who uh, have severe or immediate allergic reaction to any of the components should not get the virus, I mean the vaccine. Um, and anybody with seasonal or food allergies uh, is not considered, that's not considered a contraindication. Next. So what are some facts versus fiction um, about the vaccine? So the vaccines cannot give you COVID-19 infection. They do not include live virus. It will not, they will not change your DNA or your genes. The mRNA, um, which has brought, uh, had some concern brought up about it, but it enters the cells, but not the nucleus of your cells, which is where your DNA actually resides. And it quickly breaks down out and disappears after stimulating the immune system. And I liken that to kind of like a Snapchat photo, it just disappears after it re it's been read. Um, after, if you've had COVID-19 infection, you should still get vaccinated. The vaccine does not affect a woman's fertility. That was a completely unfounded myth that spread on social media. And the vaccine was made with routine vaccine ingredients and these ingredients stabilize the active ingredients. Um, it does not include any materials such as implants, microtrips, uh, tracking devices, stem cells, or fetal tissue. Next. Some other quick questions. Should I test for antibodies before or after getting the vaccine? No, this is not recommended at this time. Commercial tests right now do not test for uh, vaccine-specific immunity, um, and it uh, needs to be a very specific test done to the spike protein. So if you've had the test done and it was negative, um, know that that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not immune. Uh, what about reactions to the vaccine? So everyone who gets the vaccine is monitored for 15 to 30 minutes after their uh, vaccine. Most reactions will be mild and they'll resolve in a few days. So injection site soreness, swelling, redness, fever, headache, tiredness, muscle aches, uh, chills, and nausea are common. 
If your symptoms do seem more severe or you are concerned, let your doctor know so that they can monitor you. And when should I postpone my vaccine? Um, if you are feeling ill or you have any signs of COVID-19 infection, or if you've had another vaccine with two weeks, those would be reasons. Next. So what about real life data? So far, the studies that are following people who have received the vaccines are looking very good. One study looked at almost 4,000 healthcare professionals who we know are um, more exposed to uh, the virus. And they were tested weekly for COVID both before and after getting the vaccine. We saw that even after the first dose, there was 80% protection. And after the second dose, it was 90%. Moderna and Pfizer just released reports last week that the antibodies persist to at least six months, which is great news. Um, it was also known, announced last week that a booster may be needed six to 12 months after your initial vaccine series, but specifics are still to be de de determined. And how about in uh, patients with liver disease? So ongoing studies are happening, and this is important uh, to do. Uh, we're seeing that the immune response may be blunted in transplant recipients. So finally, this is a race between the vaccines and the variants um, and to get our population immunized as quickly as possible. Next, I just wanna do one quick um, slide on the J&J &J pause, which I know many of you may be wondering about and we're watching this evolve um, in front of us right now. So on April 13th, uh, CDC and FDA recommended a pause for J&J's vaccine for further investigation of some uh, reports, there were six reports of a rare and severe type of blood clot um, and which had accompanying low platelets that reported. Um, they were all in women between the ages of 18 and 48. Um, the symptoms occurred six to 13 days after vaccination. And so they're investigating that. Um, the denominator, which is I think is important to look at in this, was that almost 7 million doses of, of um, actually at this point it's been more, it's 7.6 or 7.4 million doses have been administered so far in the US which means that we're looking at a probability of less than one um, case of this per 1 million doses. So in terms of probability, putting this into perspective, um, clots, clots are actually uh, very common in COVID. Up to 30% in some studies of COVID patients in the ICU actually do develop clots. So it's something that um, you know, can happen uh, in the natural infection. Um, and just in terms of probability, um, the chances of being hit by lightning is one in a million. So actually even a little higher than that and dying in a car accident is 38 in a, in a million. And yet we often, we live our lives not often thinking about these statistics. So just to put things in perspective. And so far, um, more than 180 million doses have administ been administered so far of the, uh, of the mRNA vaccines. And so far we don't see any reports matching these kinds of symptoms. So this is obviously evolving um, and we're wa all watching uh, to see what happens. So I've wrapped up my part. I'm gonna hand this over to, to Corey next. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Sue, for your very informative talk and sharing your experience as a clinician and a patient. Um, so I'm first going to begin talking about variants and what this means for all of you and me. Next slide, please. My disclosure is that I am on the Speakers Bureau for Salix and Gilead and my spouse consults for um, a few companies as well. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so what we know about the variants of COVID-19, any virus, not just COVID-19, constantly change through mutations and new variants are expected. Sometimes they show up and they go away and other times they emerge, but they persist. Scientists, especially in this case, are constantly monitoring and analyzing these changes to better understand how these variants are going to impact us. So the CDC has established three classifications. One, one is a variant of interest or VOI, and the CDC is looking at dozens of these at this point right now. Um, there's variants of concerns or VOC, um, and I'll be discussing a few of those later. And thankfully, we don't yet have any variants of high consequence or VOHCs. Next slide, please. So why is surveillance important? Well, Unfortunately, there's potential consequences of these emergent variants, right? So there's the ability of the variants to spread more quickly. There's the ability for the variants to cause milder disease than the COVID-19 strain that originally occurred or even more severe disease. There is some ability to evade detection. This is unlikely because thankfully there's multiple targets on the PCR tests that we're using right now. So the virus would have to change a ton for it to become undetectable. 
Uh, another potential consequence is decreased susceptibility to therapies such as monoclonal antibodies, which Sue went over, and the ability to evade natural or vaccine-induced immunity. Now, the, the good thing is that the virus would again have to accumulate multiple mutations in the spike protein in order for this to happen. Um, but theoretically, there is immune pressure that could favor these, what the news is calling escape mutants. But experts believe this is unlikely just because of the nature of the virus. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, there's currently five VOCs or variants of concerns in the United States. There's the B117. This was initially detected in the UK and first here in the US in December of 2020. There's B1351. This was the South African variant that was detected in December of 2020 and found in the US in January of 2021. There's P1, and this was first identified in Brazilian travelers in Japan. Um, and it was first identified here in the US in January of 2021. And then there's the B1427 and B1429 variants that were first identified in California in February, and they were classified as variants of concerns earlier in March. Next slide. So which, light, which variant am I most likely to encounter, or all of us most likely to encounter at this point? At this time, it's likely the B117. Why? Because this mutation allows uh, this, this version of the virus to attach to cells more easily. The carriers shed higher levels of the virus, and they stay infectious for longer periods of time. And honestly, though, the main concern is that this is the variant spreading quickly among the unvaccinated. And a variant is likely what any of us are going to encounter at this point, not the original COVID-19 virus. Next. So variants and vaccines. <laughs> Next slide. Can the COVID vaccine still protect me? I know there's a lot of muddled messages surrounding the rise of variants and a lot of scary things in the news, but all of the major vaccines have performed relatively well against the variant B117, which is the one that we're all most likely to encounter at this point in time. There's also protect protection against infection at all or developing serious illness in an areas where B117 is circulating widely. Now there is some concern that the B1351 and the P1 are better at dodging the vaccines, but this doesn't mean that the vaccines aren't going to work at all. They're still going to offer some protection, even if it is less effective against the variant, it could still be helpful in presenting uh, any of us from getting really, really sick or even dying due to the, the variant that we've contracted. There's a lot of cushion provided by this crop of vaccines. Next. So a few questions. If the vaccines are working, why are we hearing about these breakthrough cases? <laughs> well, these breakthrough cases are very, very rare, even as the variants fuel surges in these case counts, because honestly, no vaccine is foolproof. So what is the risk of getting infected after the vaccination? The honest answer is that nobody really knows for sure, but we have some clues and the clues are good. For now, the variants don't appear to be increasing the rate of infection in vaccinated people, but this could change as more data is collected. And another question that I hear often is, am I gonna need a booster? <laughs> well, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Vaccine developers are already working on this. We're just not sure when, and we're not sure who. Some patients may down the line require a third vaccine as data comes out. Um, and honestly, likely we'll probably end up getting a yearly COVID vaccine as time goes on. We're not yet sure when a booster will be needed, for now, we're kind of safe to say that these vaccines are working for about six months. Next slide, please. So now what? Next. The bottom line is that the risk still ultimately lies with the unvaccinated. The perception that these vaccines don't work against variants at all is just simply incorrect. As I mentioned before, these vaccines prevent contracting the infection. And even if, God forbid, you would, it would hopefully prevent against serious illness, hospitalization, and death. So what would Dr. Fauci do? He'd say, go get vaccinated. That's the message. And in the meantime, keep wearing a mask, keep avoiding gathering in groups, and we want to especially do this to protect the unvaccinated in addition to ourselves. 
Next slide. So now on to my next portion of this, the CDC guidelines. What should I do pre and post vaccination to protect myself? Next slide, please. My disclosures again. <laughs> okay, so before the vaccine, we've all been doing this for over a year now, but just in case anyone has lived under a rock, I'm gonna go over it again. <laughs> Wear a mask that covers your nose and mouth, stay six feet apart, avoid crowds, avoid poorly ventilated indoor spaces, wash your hands often with either soap and water or alcohol sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. You wanna clean and disinfect everything, and get a COVID-19 vaccine when it's available to you. My patients often ask me, which, which vaccine is best, which would I get? And I say, the one that's most readily available to you because that is the answer. Next. One thing I'd like to talk about is routine procedures and screenings. Most routine medical procedures can be performed before or after getting a COVID-19 vaccine. A lot of places have been really good about testing, um, before more invasive aerosolizing procedures. So the risk to both the providers and the patients is actually quite low. Um, the main recommendation of the CDC is that you wanna separate your COVID-19 vaccine by at least 14 days from any other vaccines you may be getting at the time. And as far as mammogram, it's important to not really have a mammogram around the time you're getting the COVID-19 vaccine. You either wanna get this breast cancer screening before the vaccination or waiting at least four to six weeks until after the vaccine's completion. It, the vaccine does cause swollen glands or lymphadenopathy, as we say, and it may cause false readings and lead to more diagnostic testing. Next slide, please. So I also, before the vaccine, wanna talk about protection against side effects. The CDC does not recommend pre-medicating with ibuprofen, Aleve, aspirin, Tylenol to prevent symptoms. They also don't recommend that you take antihistamines to prevent allergic reactions. If you do get uh, side effects such as sight pain, you may want to use a cool, clean, wet washcloth on the area and also use and exercise your arm after you get the vaccine to kind of spread out the serum. To reduce discomfort from fever, the best thing is to drink fluids and to dress lightly. If you absolutely need to take something, it is okay to medicate post-vaccine side effects if needed. So after you've had the vaccine, if you're feeling kind of crappy, it's okay to take acetaminophen, but keep in mind if you have liver disease or a liver transplant, you want to limit your intake of acetaminophen to 2000 milligrams or two grams within a 24 hour period. That's still a lot of Tylenol. That's still four extra strength Tylenol spread out over six hours. Next slide, please. So what to do when you've been fully vaccinated? Have you been fully vaccinated? Well, according to the CDC, people are considered fully vaccinated two weeks after the second dose series of Pfizer or Moderna, or two weeks after a single dose series, the J&J &J vaccine. However, the caveat is we may not be able to assume patients with liver disease or liver transplant are necessarily fully vaccinated. Unfortunately, we have no test availability at this time to reliably tell us if someone is protected. So efficacy in your patient population is actually unclear. Um, a lot of people ask about antibodies and, and getting these, these checked. Well, Right now, we don't know how well antibody testing equates to immunity. Oftentimes, the antibody testing that the labs use um, are a protein that looks at kind of natural immunity versus the anti-spike protein that comes from immunization. So right now, we don't recommend that people get antibody tested. Next slide. So what you should keep doing, even once you've been fully vaccinated, you still wanna wear masks and socially distance when you're in public. You wanna avoid ga gathering with unvaccinated people from more than one household or visiting with an unvaccinated person um, or a person who lives with someone who's at an increased risk of um, severe COVID-19. You still wanna avoid large crowds and large gatherings, follow workplace and travel precautions, and honestly still watch out for signs and symptoms of COVID-19. 
obviously the symptom signs and symptoms of the vaccine can replicate this, but the symptoms of the vaccine should go away within a day or two. If you're feeling these symptoms longer than that, you may want to consider getting a COVID test. Next slide. So what you can start doing according to the CDC if you are considered fully vaccinated. You, according to the CDC, can gather indoors with fully vaccinated people without wearing a mask or staying six feet apart. And you can gather indoors with unvaccinated people of any age from one household without a mask, staying six feet apart, unless anyone has an increased risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Once again, this is a CDC recommendation to the general population and not necessarily keeping in mind those with liver diseases. If you've been around someone who has COVID-19, you do not need to stay away from others or get tested unless symptomatic, unless of course you live in a group setting. Next slide, please. Travel. <laughs> so it's probably prudent to still avoid unnecessary travel, but if you must, pay close attention to the situation at your destination, because these recommendations may not align with those of where you're going. So travel within the US, for the most part, there's no testing before or after travel or no, no self-quarantine after travel. Now the caveat to this is Hawaii. A colleague who's reviewing my slides actually pointed this out, so he must have wanted to go to Hawaii. He was checking this out. <laughs> so I looked it up, and um, until May 19th, they're still require, requiring testing to come in or a mandatory period of quarantine, but this should lift on May 11th. As far as international travel, uh, no testing is required before leaving the U.S. unless it's required by the destination. You still will need to show a negative test or documented recovery if you contracted COVID abroad, which I hope that's not the case, but you need, to, you need to prove that before boarding a flight back into the United States. It's still recommended that you do get tested three to five days after international travel, but there's no need for self-quarantine after arriving back in the United States. Next slide, please. So it comes down to what we know and what we're learning. In the beginning, we were fighting a battle with blindfolds on, but every day you just learn more and more and more about COVID, we all have. Um, so we know that vaccines are effective at presenting COVID-19 disease, severe illness and death. What we're still learning is exactly how effective the vaccines are against variants. We know that prevention by wearing a mask, social distancing, we know these steps help stop the spread of these disease and these steps are still important even after vaccination. However, we're still learning how well the vaccines keep people from spreading the disease, even though early data shows it'll probably help. We're still learning how long vaccines offer protection. As I said before, right now it's looking like about six months. And most importantly to this group, we're still learning about vaccine efficacy in patients with liver disease and liver transplants. Next slide. So these are um, patient resources, and I believe now we will be moving on to the Q&A. I want to thank our presenters. Thank you so much. You have been absolutely fabulous. And uh, we really appreciate also all of the attendees that are sending us questions. So know that those of you who have put in your questions, we are going to get to them. I think a lot of them are going to be covered uh, in combined with some of the other questions. And I think in fairness to everybody, let's make sure that we're um, doing both the transplant patient questions, which are really important and relative, but more specific to the transplant community. We want to give equal time to the non-transplant community. So I'm going to try and do that with our moderation. But I want to um, kick it off um, if Karen would mind um, giving us an intro into our um, Q&A section. Well, as we talked about earlier, there's no question that's a dumb question. And I know that patients are sometimes a little nervous to ask those questions. I know I would take questions into my doctor's office and then would kind of feel funny pulling out my, my little pad. And I hope that you guys are enjoying this opportunity to, I'm looking down here at the chat. I'm really happy to see all the questions in the chat. And um, please feel free. We've got a, a great broad um, group here that are helping to answer. But I wanted to share a little bit about what happened whenever I got COVID because as a transplant recipient and I was on that COVID-19, I was volunteering to do all that writing. So I knew everything that was going on as the, the numbers came in and how closely these doctors were studying it. 
And so I hunkered down. My husband did all the grocery shopping. I live out in the woods, didn't see anyone. And then my grandkids, you know, they said, Nan, can we come over for between Thanksgiving and can we come over and spend the night? And everyone had been healthy and I let my guard up and they came in and I was lying here on the couch with my 19 year old granddaughter. And she got the call from a friend who said they just tested positive and family members were testing positive. And my heart just sunk, you know, I was terrified. So I knew what the news was, but I still called my team. And of course, immediately um, they said, you know, get in and get a test. And I did within 24 hours, I got the rapid test and it was negative. And so I thought, well, maybe I'm okay. Maybe I've tiptoed past this. I felt really foolish and um, just felt like I'd really taken a risk with my health. And after having uh, received a donated liver, I really try to protect it like many of you. And, but then within about three or four days, I, after the negative test, my fever began to actually spike. At first it was just low grade. Oh, could just be, you know, the body aches just, you know, it could have just been something, but I woke up one day and uh, the headache and the backache and the body aches were, were pretty harsh, so bad that I barely made it downstairs and hubby said, let's just go ahead and go, go back in. So after two negative tests, um, I called my doctor again and they just said, let's just go ahead and, you know, go ahead and take off and, you know, part of your immune suppressants. And everyone needs to talk to their team about this. And for me, we did, we dropped the cell sept just to half of a dose, but I went ahead and stayed with my, um, my prograph. And, but I went ahead and took the, the all of the, the, ate the food and drank the drinks. I drank a lot of orange juice. I was real careful to get plenty of vitamin C. I took my multiple vitamin, drank a lot of water and uh, stayed moving and did a lot of, uh, a lot of deep breathing and uh, kept coughing. And by about, I think it was actually day 14, my husband said, we're going back in. And we went through the urgent care. And this time I got a positive test and it was really frightening. You know, my chest X-ray came out okay. But um, so I guess I'm saying that to say, I understand the fears that we go through and we, there are no easy answers. And if you're living with liver disease, you know that there, we don't get pat answers. And that's part of our hardiness that we have is that we can live with those no easy answers. And we can trust our team so that when we hit the wall and you know everything that can happen happens, you know, when we have that bleed out or when we have that, that those, blood lab, those bad uh, blood labs that we have someone we can put our trust in. And that's why I really am thankful for the members of the ASLD for putting all these guidelines out here for our doctors to use. So I made it through, I didn't go to the hospital. I didn't want uh, steroids because I only have one kidney and um, I didn't want steroids. So I just, my doctor was like calling every day. My nurse practitioner called me. It's like, how are you doing? How are you taking your blood pressure? Just like, just like these guys have said. And uh, I made it through. And then even I just said that I'm not going through that again. And I got the vaccine and sure enough, I was in bed for a couple of days. I guess I'm a wimp, but I was in bed for a couple of days and did my yoga and Tai Chi and did fine and just got my second vaccine. And I feel very confident and I'm very thankful. I'm so thankful to have a little bit of a uh, prevention. One virus almost killed me and um, I just didn't want this virus to do it. So I'm, I'm just, all I had was a, a little bit of hair loss from uh, having such a long-term fever. I, the fever did go on for a few weeks back in December. And I'm just really grateful for the vaccine. I'm th thankful for you guys for inviting us here today to, to have a patient group talk. Karen, thank you so much for sharing that story, both about the infection and the vaccine. I mean, I, that's like bookends around this particular piece. So um, and you share it so well, and I'm sure there's people in our audience that can probably resonate. It resonates with a lot. On the note, though, I think one of the things we're getting a lot of questions in buckets about the immunotransplant uh, or the immunosuppressed population, both relative to infection and to the, but more particularly about the vaccination. So I want to lead off our question and answer session by kicking this off to, I think Dr. Fix perhaps was the one that might be ready to answer this. Can you answer? We've had many questions about, I've had a transplant. I might have a blended response to the vaccine. I'm on immunosuppressants. Does cell sept interfere with my vaccine? So can you address that a little bit for us and also about the representation in clinical trials or in, in data? Um, in regards to that particular issue. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of these questions, not only in this webinar, but, you know, before this webinar from patients and from providers, a lot of uncertainty and questions about whether the vaccine is going to be effective in patients with liver disease or after liver transplant. 
Uh, we know that patients with chronic liver disease in general respond less well to vaccines, not specifically the COVID vaccines, but uh, other vaccines that we, we, are, we know are out there. Uh, so there's reasonable concern that, that patients with chronic liver disease may respond less well to the COVID vaccine. Same with patients on immunosuppression, whether it's pre-transplant or post-transplant, we anticipate that patients may respond less well. That doesn't mean that patients don't respond at all. It doesn't mean that a lower response equals no response. And I think that's a really important message. So even if we had really good data to tell us that patients respond less well, that doesn't mean don't bother with the vaccine because the vaccine may still protect you and a little protection is better than no protection. There hasn't been any real safety concerns with respect to patients with liver disease or post-transplant patients. The concern is really just about efficacy. Is it gonna work? And if it doesn't work as well, is it still enough? So I think that's an important message. You've already heard from the presentations that there aren't a lot of patients with liver disease or post-transplant patients from the clinical trials. And there aren't enough patients in those clinical trials to really tell us the answer to these questions. So what we have now are patients who are getting the vaccine because it's approved or authorized, I should say, not formally approved. Uh, after they've been authorized, we're getting data and we're trying to piece this all together. But there's no placebo-controlled studies anymore. Uh, in, in patients post-marketing. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with a study that came out from Johns Hopkins uh, that was uh, after the first dose of one of the mRNA vaccines, so that's Pfizer or Moderna, in patients who have had a transplant. And the study has reported really low antibody responses uh, to the first dose of this vaccine. And that's certainly a cause for concern. It, it's along the lines of what I've been saying that these vaccines may have less of an effect in patients after transplant or patients who are on immunosuppression. So it's not entirely surprising, uh, but this is really very preliminary data. It's, it's uh, first of all, a, not a randomized study. This is patients that have had the vaccine and then have voluntarily provided their information. Uh, so it's not randomized. It's what we call a convenient sample. Uh, there's no control group. It's also data from only one dose. We expect that there will be data after the second dose coming soon, but data after one dose doesn't give us the whole picture. And I think really importantly, data from that same study has already come out after the second dose on the safety of these vaccines. And it appears that people who have had a transplant are having pretty much the same kinds of responses, you know, minimal uh, local side effects, so pain, redness, minimal systemic side effects like headache, fever, uh, fatigue, uh, not much more than what's being reported from the clinical trials or what's being reported from the general population. There haven't been any really significant safety concerns in, in these studies for patients post-transplant. So I think the message is we're going to get more data. Uh, it's not going to be complete data because it's not going to be randomized controlled trials, but it's going to give us some uh, information about the efficacy of these vaccines in patients after transplant. And we will get data on patients with liver disease as well. But it's not a reason to not get the vaccine. I think the risk of getting COVID in, in all of these populations, whether it's liver disease or post-transplant, far outweighs the risk of the vaccines as far as we know today. And so we really encourage people to get the vaccine that's available to you. Right. So Certainly, I guess or in, I, so go ahead. I was going to. No, talk. I was just going to finish by saying, you know, right now there's more concern about the safety of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. That's currently not available in the United States as the CDC looks into it a little bit more. Uh, so, you know, I think there's reason to be concerned. Uh, but again, the the benefit still seems to outweigh the risk, and we'll wait more data to to really know that. Yeah. So yeah, I was going to. There was a lot of doctor speak going on in there, and so I'm I want to make sure. Yeah, no, that's good. You're a doctor. That's what we expect. But to wait to. And your summary, though, that I took away was there's not enough evidence of lack of safety for all the for all the concerns and the open gaps and the worry there that outweighs in any way, shape, or form, even by a magnitude of a thousand, the benefit to potentially being gained. Right. So. Right get the vaccine because it's safe. If it doesn't have as great effect as, we, as we really want it to do, but it might, it's worth doing. That's right. Okay. And, and you'd asked about MMF or mycophenolate or Celsept, all of these, azathioprine, these are all similar classes of drugs uh, that patients that have autoimmune diseases or have had a transplant might be on. Um, so that same study I referenced, the very preliminary data, uh, did suggest that, and, and we've seen some other studies that suggest that patients on those drugs 
uh, may not respond as well to the vaccines or may even have a worse uh, outcome after they get infected with COVID-19. Uh, so I think you need to be really careful there as well. We, we still don't know enough. Uh, the, the risk of stopping those drugs or lowering the doses of those drugs could be greater than staying on them. You know, you don't want to risk getting uh, a flare of your disease or getting uh, a, a, a rejection episode that could be much worse than the infection itself. And so right now I would say follow the advice of your provider if you're on one of those drugs. Probably no reason to change those doses uh, before you get COVID, but if you get COVID, that, that might be a reason to, to lower it. And that I would go based on your provider's recommendations. I would also add that, you know, we're not recommending that people lower or stop those drugs in advance of a vaccine, hoping you might get a better response, because again, the, the risk might be greater uh, than the benefit. And just for the audience to know, I know we're coming down to the, you know, we got 10 to 15 minutes left. 15 minutes left. We are going to keep addressing questions as long as we possibly can. I'm going to give you a highlight. I want to go to two different areas that we're getting a lot of questions on. One is about um, the antibody testing and what antibodies mean and what does, where does that all fit into it? And then the other area I want to go to is about other medicines, people that might be on hep B medicines or hep C medicines or other non-immunosuppressive medications. So um, Sue, would you um, take that last uh, question about the medicines that people are on and whether or not, Oren talked about mm -hmm. immunosuppressants, but other things that should change when, when people are getting the COVID vaccine? Or not? Sure. I think a lot of the other liver medicines, which are not immunosuppressants, are fine. I understand people's concerns, but there's no biologic reason we would think that it would interfere with vaccine response. And so we've, and I, and we, get, I get questions every single day from patients, whether it's their blood pressure medicine or their, you know, everybody's worried, like, what does this mean for me? Um, and what we can gather is that from all the data, um, non-immunosuppressive medications uh, will not, you know, are, are, are fine. And uh, also with other comorbidities, people often wonder if they're okay to the vaccine. And really the message is for the general population, for everybody, um, you need to get the vaccine. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. And then what about um, Nancy? Would you mind talking to us a little bit about antibody testing and what that all means as far as the vaccine efficacy and for us as people getting the vaccine? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, and you know, if you asked a specific question, I think Dr. Fix and I tried to answer a, a few of these at, as they were coming up, but it's really important to, to note that we don't have a, a line in the sand where we know if your antibody level is higher than that, you have great protection. And if your antibody lower is level than that, you have bad protection. This is true about many vaccines. Even if you look at hepatitis B vaccination, which is excellent. If you've been vaccinated, you can still kind of what we call seroconvert. You can still get exposed to hep B and, and have some, you know, some not exactly actual infection, but a little bit of slippage so that there's not a direct line between the amount of antibody and your degree of protection. There are also lots and lots of companies that make different antibody tests. And so you can't have one antibody and, may, and match it to another antibody test. Um, they are not well regulated, which is again why they're not actually um, being advocated for and may not be paid for by your insurance because we just don't know if we can use them. So one of the questions is if I have antibody, can I run around naked and travel everywhere? The answer is no, no, still wear your mask. Definitely act like you may not have gotten that vaccine. The antibody, it helps us understand as a research tool, if the vaccine might be doing what it's supposed to, but we are not able to apply it to what you can do in real life. And we cannot apply it into how safe it's gonna be for you to travel or for, you know, maybe even for a booster shot. We don't know that we can draw any, any line to, to act actionable items with that antibody. Yeah, and I would and also or, say, yeah, please wear clothes too when you're traveling, running around, right? Okay. Clothes are recommended, at least yeah. the underwear, <laughs> depending on where you're going. All right. I would also add that some of the antibody, you know, the antibody test might be to different proteins. So the, the vaccines are meant to elicit a response to the spike protein. Everybody's been hearing about the spike protein that, that gives uh, the, the coronavirus its name. And all of the vaccines that have been developed are against that. So antibody testing would be would, would show development of antibodies to the spike protein. But there are antibody tests out there to other proteins that the virus produces that might show evidence of a past infection, but not evidence of vaccination. You may not know uh, which test you're getting if you get an antibody test, and it may not give you any information about uh, your vaccine status. But even as Dr. Rowe 
uh, mentioned, even if you've got a positive or a negative antibody response after vaccination, we still don't know if that means you're either protected or not protected from future infection. There's still not enough information. The, the immune system is complex. It's much more than just antibody formation, and we don't have the whole picture. So I think the summary is antibody testing. Don't do it. Okay. Um, well, you can do it, but do it in a situation that's research-based or don't use the data to make clinical decisions quite yet. Yeah, I think, and I think this is evolving too, because there, I know we've talked to the Quest rep and they do have a specific test for, that's specific for antibodies, but you have to know exactly how to order it. And most, most of us were not aware of that, right? So um, I think pe the problem is that people are taking the information and applying it in a way that is not necessarily true in terms of, oh, I, I didn't respond. This is, I heard, I heard another doctor say, I tested everybody, nobody responded. I was like, oh, but you didn't know, like that actually, the, that antibody test doesn't test for vaccine response. And so I think we're in a gray area now and it may evolve, you know, at some point we may have better um, antibody tests. So. And then, yeah, I think I'm um, Karen's back on now. Did Karen, did you want to add anything about antibody uh, testing? Cause uh, you'd, you'd had a comment here. Well, I, I just, I know a lot of people have um, asked for the antibody testing and felt like that was going to be important. And so thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing that because we thought that it might give us some information that would make us feel safer. We're, that's, that's the patient thing. Um, you know, as Sue said, how safe am I? What am I? What meds can I take? And so there were two or three people who got antibody testing and came into our, our Facebook chat and uh, we were all like so jealous. But, um, and I think it's great if your doctor orders it, but if we can't get it, then we know that it's not a, like you said, it's not a definitive answer for anything. And we still need to follow those safety guidelines and, and get both doses of, of, the, of the vaccine that we can, that are accessible to us. Um, one other question that's come up a little bit. Thank you, Karen, for putting that in there. One of the, I'm trying to get as many questions answered as I could. It came up twice. Um, something about what about vaccine, COVID vaccine and other vaccines, the, the timing together. And then also, uh, does, is it vary about COVID vaccine and flu vaccine by patient population, like uh, fatty liver disease patients, non-alcoholic hepatitis patients versus autoimmune or cirrhotic patients. So um, is anybody uh, rare, raring to jump in and ask that one? I didn't prepare people ahead of time on that one, I don't think. So currently the CDC guidelines are that you separate the COVID-19 vaccine, any of the COVID-19 vaccines by at least two weeks from other vaccines. Now, obviously, if you're getting the two dose COVID vaccine series, and then you're getting, for example, the hepatitis B vaccine series that is multiple doses, it may get a little complicated. So it may be, you know, a good idea to defer it like until after the COVID-19 vaccine, because that, in my opinion, should be the priority at this point in time. Um, but CDC is saying two weeks. Okay. But specifically like the COVID vaccination and the flu shot or the COVID, it, this was the question that actually came up twice, the H1N1 flu and COVID. Yes, you can, get both, can you get both of those? So for right now, um, I mean, it's we're kind of out of flu season at this point. So that's not gonna, I think, come up until fall, but um, pharmaceutical companies, I think maybe already looking at combining um, vaccines and boosters in the future. So I think there will be a lot more to come on that. I had a good follow-up question in the chat in the question answer to this. And it looks like Oren may be trying to answer it right now. So if we're giving this recommendation for you wait for 14 days after you get a vaccine, how did they determine that if they don't believe antibody testing? How do you reconcile that? Yeah, that, there's some concern that if there's competing uh, vaccines and the, your immune system is trying to respond to those vaccines and produce antibodies or, or whatever the body does to to protect you against future infection that there is you've got another uh, vaccine in, in play. Now it's not absolute. Two weeks is probably arbitrary, um, but it's a general recommendation. So it's not absolute. If, if you're off by a few days or if for some reason you've, you've had a for example, a hepatitis B vaccine and you're offered the COVID vaccine a week later, you should get it. You know, it'd be great if you could wait two weeks, but it's not an absolute recommendation. It's, it's just a suggestion. Um, all right. Um, is there anything about diet that we need to know about either COVID infection or around the time of the vaccination? Karen, you want to answer that one for us? 
Well, and my, my doctor, you know, concurred with what I typically do, which is to try to get as many vitamins as I can from my diet. So that means a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables. I'm, I'm a big cook at home and eat girl. Cause that's um, how I made it through hep C treatment with Tilopravir and all of my stuff. So I'm a big believer in uh, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, cook and eat at home. Now we did, uh, we, we just did a lot of bone broth, which for us, um, and if you're a vegetarian, but make sure you're getting plenty of fluids and the body needs protein to heal. So my doctor, my nurse practitioner is actually the one she's and pushing me to stay with a lot of protein. My body can't heal without protein. And so while the virus is ravaging our body, um, we do need protein and we need a lot of liquids. So hydrate, I actually hydrated up to 80 ounces a day because I was sweating a lot. I kept a constant sweat with the, uh, um, with the fever that I ran. So I just think just the typical, you know, healthy diet, make sure plenty of vitamin C and uh, talk to your doctor if they'd like to add any supplements um, in case you're not getting enough nutrition. Thanks, Karen. All right, I'm going to put out one last question that I think is important to answer. And then I want to start wrapping this up because um, to respect everybody's time, it sounds like we've got a lot of great questions. I hopefully we have covered all of the, I, I think we have, but in the wrap up for the panelists, I'm going to let them answer anything that's left on But the one I want to put out there is, will the vaccine or COVID-19 cause my autoimmune hepatitis to flare or another person asked cause rejection in my liver transplant? So both the infection and the vaccine in autoimmune hepatitis and post-transplant rejection risk. How about Dr. Rowe? Would you like to tell us about, you wanna talk about infection and we'll have Dr. Fix talk about vaccination. Sound good? Sure. So um, most viruses are immune modulatory. And so I have not seen someone who had a flare or evidence of rejection from COVID-19, but there is a very well-described case report of someone who was post-transplant, acquired COVID-19 and actually had a liver biopsy. The liver biopsy was read as acute cellular rejection. However, they, when they stained it, they also found COVID-19 in the tissue. And so um, whether or not the COVID infection looked like rejection or whether the COVID infection cause rejection, it's very reasonable that you, you could have a flare of either your autoimmune disease or an episode of rejection if you get COVID-19. That's probably a very important reason to not prophylactically reduce or you know, to not reduce your, your immune medicines because you think you might get infection and only have them reduced if you actually have infection and you're working with your team of clinicians to uh, adjust your medications. Yeah, I agree with that exactly. I think, you know, based on what you've heard, it's reasonably to be concerned that your immune medica your immune suppression medications may put you at higher risk of getting COVID or higher risk of not responding well to the vaccine. But the risk of lowering those doses or stopping those medications may be higher. Don't make any changes in your medicines without talking to your provider first. Uh, and generally speaking, there's no reason to change those medicines unless you have COVID and you're, and you're actually severely ill that is in the hospital. That's when sometimes those medications are adjusted. Uh, as far as the risk of rejection after vaccination, it's been reported. Uh, I think it was extremely rare, if at all reported in the clinical trials that the study from Johns Hopkins that I referenced earlier did report one episode of rejection after the second, or after the first dose, I believe, of the vaccine, uh, but still too early to know if it's because of the vaccine. So there is some concern that getting a vaccine, sort of revving up your immune system, could elicit a, a rejection response, but we really don't know right now what that risk is with the COVID vaccination. Great. Thank you so much to the panelists. Thanks for all the questions. And on behalf of my co-moderator, Karen, I want to just be so, I'm so grateful to our panelists, but I'm really grateful to our attendees because you are the ones that drove what we did here. You're the ones that came up with the questions that put us through our paces that um, really um, asked the good really appropriate questions to you. And we are happy to be here and glad for you to join us. I want to give each of our panelists like 30 seconds to say one last tidbit that they feel like I screwed up or messed up as moderator, didn't cover or a question they feel is burning that they need to answer or just a, 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 a chance. Um, so Sue, would you like to lead off on um, your, your wrap up? Yeah, so I think this is, you know, obviously evolving things. So what we say today may totally change next week or at least some part of it. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, we all have to really stay vigilant still, you know, the, the masking is really important, um, social distancing and, 
uh, all that, but it's also been great to see us be able to open up and do more activities. And I just think it's a very hopeful time for us now as well. So uh, thank you all for, for um, being part of this webinar. Corey, Dr. Burke. Yes, thank you. I see providers on here. I see patients on here. So thank you so much for joining today. Um, did we address uh, contracting COVID-19 from a liver transplant? Go for it. You're on your own. Yeah, I think that would be something important. So I, I, I know that that's a question that I've been asked by patients before. And there was a report back in February, um, the American Journal of Transplantation of a, a lung recipient getting COVID um, from their transplant. Unfortunately, that patient died. But the majority of centers were transplanting the entire year while COVID was flaring. And that was honestly the first report. So I, I think it's a very rare chance and procurement during procurement donors are aggressively screened for COVID-19 so as not to transmit that. Um, so just, just so all of you guys out there waiting for a liver feel a little bit at ease about that. Thank you, Corey. Dr. Rowe, any last words? Um, I really just want to thank all my co-panelists and the attendees. You know, we aren't going to get smarter unless you push the envelope and ask these difficult questions. I've been vaccinated. My whole family's been vaccinated. I guess I'm soon up for my booster. So I'm a really strong advocate for um, vaccination because I think this is how we're going to most quickly resume anything that's at all normal. A big plug for ASLD in Anaheim. Hopefully we'll actually get there. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Dr. Fix, any last words? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just reiterate what I've been saying during this webinar. I think as patients with liver disease, patients who have had a transplant, it's reasonable to be worried that you're not represented by the clinical trials, that all of the CDC recommendations out there may not apply to you. That's fair. Uh, but I think everything we know so far suggests that these vaccines are safe for patients with liver disease and patients after transplant. Uh, the concern about it being less effective is reasonable, uh, but less effective doesn't mean not effective. And I think the risk of getting COVID right now is much higher uh, than the risk of the vaccine itself. So please get the vaccines uh, when they're available to you, which should be now. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll learn more as we study this more. And for myself, I'll just say, and we'll let Karen round it out and be our closing speaker. I just want to thank everybody again. And also, I am a vaccinated person, but I'm a vaccinator. I spend a lot of time doing consenting with people for their vaccines and talking through some of the questions. And so um, it's been an honor to be a part of more forward movement. People are um, coming forward, getting the vaccine, and I thank every single one who chooses to do that. So Karen, you want to close us up and uh, take us on home here? Oops, you're still muted. Thank you so much for that. And so um, I'm really proud to be a patient right now because um, we are um, we're vulnerable, but we're smart and we ask smart questions. And I'm so proud of the discussion here today. And I just hope that this will grow. I see some advocate groups in here, people who represent other people. And so I know this information is going to get disseminated and it's going to get it's going to move down uh, into people's lives where it needs to be. And I want to thank the superstars, which are all you medical providers from the transplant physicians and teachers all the way down um, to the patient here together. I just, I think you guys are rock stars. We're always a little bit in awe of how smart you are. And tonight you guys got to really show off. And so I say that with kind of a, my heart in my throat. Thank you from the bottom of my heart as a patient. Thank you for caring about our questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. John and Katie, you can now close up the webinar. See you maybe another time, everybody. And you can watch it on YouTube. It's being recorded. Yes. Bye, everybody.